So thanks very much. And uh, Nick wasn't on the program, but I'm really looking forward to having him um, help today um, the presentation and uh, work with us. So I want to say something at the beginning too, and maybe see the level of exuberance and that Nick has that how much of the damp and down of all that he is. Part of our presentation is designed to be provocative, but also a little tongue in cheek, but also quite serious as well. So I wouldn't use the word zealotry or anything like that, but yeah, you know, just back off that's right, absolutely. Um, just our opening premise, just to give you a sense of all this. We believe that this concept of um, what we would call emergent feedback needs to stand at the nexus of the uh, learning and teaching interaction. That it needs to be about the agency of all of the people who are involved in that process. And so that means that's the active knowledge of students and their teachers, educators, learners about the nature of them and that their agency is best expressed, not by surveilling them, but actually by actively engaging them in the conversation. So we're not saying that, um, that systems that exist that, that do that, although we will be a bit provocative around that in the presentation. Um, but we also want to say that um, what we're going to share today stands on the shoulders of decades of research done by lots and lots of people, and also probably about two decades of um, <coughs> our own work. So over to you, Nick. I oh, know you I'll stand here. You press the button. I pushed the button, yeah. Um, just firstly, so smart learning is mostly Alan's baby. You know, I wouldn't want to take too much credit for all the work he's put into it. But I work in university governance, and I guess it's sort of revealing in a way that I'm here to talk about this, because before a sod's been turned in the data sense in smart learning, we had to put a whole lot of governance structures in place. So I think it gives you sort of an idea that it's quite a different approach. It, it doesn't start with data. It's all about how we're going to use the data. One of my own backgrounds, I, I was originally trained as an engineer, and then I also trained in the humanities. So some of the discussions yesterday about, about trying to get the data to talk to the learning and all this sort of stuff, these are things I've lived in my own sort of life, I guess. And one of the things I've done in my past is, is the history of the information sciences, I guess. And there are some very common problems in most information sciences probably going back hundreds of years, people, even the people like Leibniz, they all wrestled with this same problem. So in some of the more recent manifestations of information science, we say their data mining, knowledge management, learning analytics, I think they're still struggling with some basic problems that even you know, Leibniz was struggling with hundreds of years ago. And smart learning a appealed to me because I think it sort of put its finger on what, what that problem was and how to address it. So if we just move on. This is a real old chestnut in information science the knowledge pyramid. Um, and I think, I mean this is what Leibniz discovered hundreds of years ago, that this is a hatchet job. You know, this is not how information works. So it's very common to say you can have a lot of data and then gradually you can filter your way up through into information, knowledge and wisdom. That's not how information works. And smart learning is, it's, it's data in smart learning, and we'll talk a bit more about this in later, if information is a mediator of action. It's not about action. It's a full eight, you know, it's part of the action itself. So it's not about something. The, the whole idea of analysis or analytics in this sort of process doesn't make sense. And that's actually not so much analysing, you're using the information as a mediator of your action. So we think that, you know, from that perspective, that <clears throat> in many ways we're talking about wrong process and often we're talking about wrong data. We're talking about the uh, Underrepresentation under of powerful known mo models and relationships in teaching and learning that speak to us about feedback, goal setting, some of the questions we had earlier on, teaching approaches that work, and that those sh things should be central to those models. It's often poorly connected to normal work. So we're wrestling with the issue of, well, we've got this data now, how do we use it? How do we speak back to people ethically? Or how do we speak back to teachers? <coughs> how do we speak back to instructors? When in fact, it should be part of the whole thing from the very outset. And there's a tendency to have it be done to communities. In fact, some of the previous questions uh, uh, pertain to that. Um, hasn't shown to improve learning at scale, certainly discrete studies. Um, a very strong focus on prediction over change. Fields that have travelled this road of looking at difference, like feels like inclusion, have started out looking at how do we learn more and more and more and more about this label or this category of person 
or their instructional features and characteristics that will work with this group of people. What they've evolved to is the notion of looking at the interaction and particularly are looking at the things that really do work well for those groups. And what many have found is the things that work well for some groups work profoundly well for others. And we, uh, aptitude treatment interactions in educational research are very elusive, where one thing works really well with one group and not another. The things that work really well tend to work well in principle for lots and lots of different people. So the focus on, um, on prediction uh, over looking at change and better practice. We also think that um, the technology needs to be about the interaction. So the question is, how do you have the technology empower agency as opposed to find out stuff about what's going on? So the technology becomes an emergent tool, part of a self-organising system, where capacity gets built as people use those tools, as opposed to we've got this really, really powerful engine that will tell you more and more stuff about what you're doing. It works well, and I think you know, Christian's example yesterday, it's profound when you're talking about adjusting thermostats and saving money on your electricity bill, but it's such a much more complex relationship when we talk about learning. And we shouldn't be dismissive of the profound nature of the value of that, but we've got to be really careful about we hand, how we transfer those ideas across into much, much more complex domains. So, um, so, we're not really talking about a change in terminology. Some people build careers on just that kind of transition. Not, we're not interested in that. It would be easy if we did that, but we're not interested in that. The idea here is that we're really interested in a fundamental sh shift in the way information is gathered and used and how it empowers agency. It's a different thing. So, let's talk a little bit about what an emerging feedback system might look like. First thing, it includes high power proximal data about known relationships. Um, the reason that we've used high powered graphic presentation here, um, and specifically the elephant, is because we think this is the elephant in the room. Right? That all of the, and these things aren't lists. When you look at something like feedback, which has been mentioned a couple of times here, feedback is the single most powerful factor in student learning. But it's only powerful if it's conceptualised within the framework of goal setting, the relationship of the student to the feedback process, the quality of what feedback is being given about. And so it's within that context. So the question becomes one of, how are you going to build process tools, methods and strategies for that problem? Okay? And that's really the essence of what we're talking about. So these aren't lists. They're things that are profoundly informative, and they've been around for a long, long time. The kind of models of student learning, whoops. Yeah, people have been looking at this for a long, long time, back to the 60s and the work of John Carroll, more recently John Hattie, looking at the way these things play out and the contribution to student learning. And they're, these are just placeholder percentages here, but they give you a sense of the way that territory has been mapped. And then if you look more closely, here are some of the things that we talk about. But when we talk about things like motivation, engagement, self-concept and self-efficacy, they have a profound influence with these things because the learning history that influenced self-efficacy is a function of how good that experience was. How good that experience was was a function of those things. So it's really about understanding and being prepared to embrace um, the complexity. And then what we're interested in at CSU in smart learning is when you go back to the previous slide and you see that only 5 to 10% of student learning is attributable to institutions, and you think, wow, what an opportunity that is, right? If we could get this, these sorts of things working together at scale, think how powerful um, our environments can be. So the second thing there is that Agency emerges as part of the normal work. And that was something that Philip mentioned when he was talking about, um, about the plan. And what we mean by that, and maybe just give you a quick example in um, smart learning, this is just a layout for building a criterion-based assessment task. So going back and connecting this to what we just talked about, 
we know that feedback is going to be contingent on the quality of the goal setting, the quality of the information students get around what feedback is going to be given to them and how well that's constructed, their involvement in the process. So from a smart learning perspective, what we'd be saying is you engage people in the conversation using those models, using that research about how to do one of these things well. You don't judge them or surveil them at that. You give them what the literature says about a good criteria assessment task before they start. And they have a crack at making sure, and this is an emergent phenomenon, because we know in any institution you have huge variability and capacity around this sort of thing. You start a conversation about how to make that better. That's, that pr preliminarily gives this information. And then you ask others to come in and give feedback. Give me some ideas about how well this has been crafted. And then you go in and then in the, in the next, next set of tools we're building at the moment, which is the student workspace, this is a layout from the, uh, this course space in Smart Tools, you ask the students the same question. Well, we designed it because we had this in mind. What do you think? Did it work for you? You don't watch them from a distance. You ask them about that stuff. What do you think about it? Is it working for you? We know you won't interact with it the way we designed it. But what do you think? Here's what we know. What do you think about it? And we, ask to get, and we get feedback on that. And then we look at how they did. We hook it up to the grade book uh, or the grade centre in Interact and we look at how it all works together. So this is what I mean about agency, collaboration, the nexus. And it's not just the teacher and the learner or the educator and the learner. It's other people. It's the people who have interest in academic literacy and numeracy in the university. Educational designers, whatever way you want to look at that. Third thing I'm going to turn over to Nick is scale. So the inter if, you, if you join the dots between what we've been talking about, this is an emergent phenomenon, and that means that it's that conversation at the most granular level with students and teachers that emerges. And if you've got data at scale, it's an emergent expression of the data moving up through the system. I'm going to turn over to Nick to talk about that. Um, this is, um, and we haven't got much time today to talk about a lot of these ideas. This is um, Gabrielle Tard who was actually, we were talking yesterday about how useful it would be to have sociologists as part of this conversation. Gabriel Tart was one of the inventors of sociology, um, but he was also much more interesting at the end than that, because he was also one of the inventors of criminology and criminal statistics. And he's being sort of rediscovered in the US a bit now, which is good, because he was um, probably one of the great undiscovered geniuses of Western thought, actually, it's a big call, but um, he was, he sat, he sat as a judge, in, in courts a lot of the time, deciding cases. He was a magistrate as well. Um, and he thought that everything we said about scale was a bit skew if He couldn't quite make sense of it. But if you think about what happens in the courtroom, every case that comes in, you might say that's the micro level, here's the individual who's in trouble, they're in court. The macro level is that big body of laws that, that has to be applied to that individual. But if you think about it in the law, um, that, that, that isn't the way we normally think of the micro and the macro. Every individual case that comes before the court can fundamentally reshape the entire edifice of law. That's what case law is all about. So he said there's, he didn't see this great distinction between the micro and the macro level. He sort of turned it on its head. And again, we don't have a lot of time to talk about how he did that. But it had some counterintuitive things like the whole is always smaller than its parts. We know that expression, the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. He said that was absolute nonsense. And so, from a systems point of view, a complex systems point of view, <coughs> holes aren't some overarching thing that sort of override individuals or the agency at that individual level. That's what Alan was talking about. Um, so sometimes the supposition we take into this work that we need to be analysing a big overarching set of data to understand what, how it applies at the individual level is completely back to front, is what Tard would have said. You have to start at the individual level to understand that level. Um, so scale is, a, is, a, is an effect. Okay. And so to give you a sense of this, when I said earlier that data is, you should think of it as a mediator rather than as information about something, a very good example of the shift in this is network traffic engineers, um, who for a lot of years <coughs> tried to crack the problem of traffic jams in an analytics, more, it's more of an analytics sort of way. They build models, they try to analyse, they have real-time control rooms like the one at the top here, and try to tweak the traffic using all sorts of different algorithms to try to prevent traffic jams was 
spectacularly un unsuccessful in almost every instance. Um, so t these days, if you look in these traffic control rooms, they tend to just have TV screens that show you individual accidents. They've given up the idea of trying to control the traffic from this spot here. What they tend to do for people to be, as we all know, is you put a GPS in your car. They realise if you give the drivers the agency and the tools and the data, they will solve that problem for you if you start at the driver level. You don't try to analyse it from a mental level. Um, and so that was a good example of how smart tools work. So I guess you give the individuals the agency and the tool, and then you don't need to do the analysis. They will, mediate, they will use that data and that technology to mediate their, their action. All right, so we have the concept in learning analytics of the middle space, as we know, which is about you know, trying to get these, this connection between analytics, <coughs> the technology, and the learning itself. From a, from a complex systems point of view, that space doesn't really even exist because the data and the technology mediates the individual interactions day by day. You don't have to try and understand that gap. That gap's not there from the start if you construct things in that way. It's a network view of the world if you're familiar with network theory or complex systems theory. And this is sort of as we've worked and we, one of the nice things about the conversation at CSU around all this work is that as Philip was alluding to it's a university so there's lots of different perspectives and that's a very cool thing and that's what makes things good. So what you can see in the analytics model for CSU is that the vernacular of some of this has started to find its way in around things like proximity and agency and the notion of people not being uh, audiences. But one of the, our next uh, challenges, so foreshadowing is always important since Nick and uh, since uh, Philip's here and Simon's here, and that is, is the concept that the model is still too linear for, from a self-organising systems perspective. What we would say is that the notions that Nick's been talking about, about self-similarity, about scale and about agency, means that it needs to be much more emergent and not conceptualised in this notion of um, middle space. And the idea that a lot of the conversation is about looking back into the conceptualisation of a middle space is actually part of the problem. That's what I was just talking about, I guess. It's a different way of thinking about data and technology as a mediator of, of everyday work, which will then generate scale from the bottom up. And when you talk about technology, and I sort of mentioned this at the opening, the idea being that technology tools should take the complexity and look at the capacity that we have to reason, as opposed to when we were talking yesterday about aggregate large amounts of information, and free us up to do that. So that, and also to enable us to do those things in more effective ways. So a, re a real technology for emergent feedback is doing more than gathering information. From our perspective, it actually helps you to be better at giving feedback. It helps you to capture those known models and that known research in ways that will allow you to design a better experience and to engage more effectively with the students. So it should build capacity, reduce cognitive load, and actually extend that uh, capacity, as well as gather stuff. The gathering stuff is the, is the easy part. So in a sense, this notion of self-similarity and self-organisation one of the key features of all the designs we work on is you should see all of the pieces in any part and all of the parts in any piece. So if you, if you had the time or the interest, which you probably don't have, and wanted me to unpack all of the theoretical frameworks in any one of the layouts and the tools, we could probably uh, do that. I didn't see anybody's heads. Then, but... So all of this rolls up to the notion of a focus on, on dynamic change and problem solving over prediction. And the idea that this work is building capacity, you're increasing the opportunity for students not so much to be surveilled, but actually to engage in a conversation with you about how they learn differently and better, how your presumptions about the way maybe that research was captured in the way you've designed a piece of uh, learning, a piece of courseware, and engaging them in that conversation and using data that's emerging all of the time for doing that, not after, but in the process of designing the learning experience, in its delivery, and in looking at how people work with it. So to the extent that there's a temporal sequence here, and this is one of the big challenges, is the confusion between there's a natural temporal sequence in just about everything. You have to design it before you deliver it, and then you have to measure it, right? But that shouldn't be confused with ideas of agency and feedback. 
which need to interact and iterate it in all of those places and inform all of the other parts. So just finally, um, what does an emergent feedback system look like? And this is a little bit of summary. It's always about high power proximal data. So it's about what you believe to be proximally connected <coughs> to things that will make a difference in students' learning, close to the learning experience and, and a, a, have an effective impact. It's always on the foreground. So the idea being that the people are in that conversation so you don't need to worry so much about surveilling and what's going on behind the curtain. It's always, always about agency, which I think we've covered reasonably well. It always scales up and never reports down. Vision for CSU is that the DVC, the PVC, is at a meeting expressing the scaled up experience, if you will, of what's happening all of the time, dealing with the same issues. The only difference is the audience and the level, but in fact the focus, the process, the methods are exactly the same. It's always transparent. As I said, focus on change and growth over prediction, non-linear and non-sequential. Always about what, and this is a really good test, always about what to do next over what happened. If you're asking the what happened question, then I'm not sure that you have an emergent feedback system. I don't, I probably should. Have. How are we doing time-wise? Um, so, just finally, Quickly, clearly, the implementation of this is complex and multifaceted. It speaks to research and theory, organisational design. <laughs> Applications, and I mean, Simon, I probably question that you've taken up with your colleagues and with the interest in complexity. Self-organisation in, in human systems are really autogenetic. It have to be a part of a design process to some extent, and it's the nexus between how you design and how you create self-organising spaces. So, so uh, smart learning is a transformational organisational change model that requires a design dimension to it. There's not going to be a spontaneous generation of a self-organising system in most higher ed environments without that influence. Um, and looking at process. So big takeaways, just those things, which I think we've covered. Thank you.